This is Lindsay Clark. I'm your primary instructor for um, current topics in medical laboratory sciences. Today we have lecture 21 and we are going to talk about errors in the clinical lab. So the monitoring of medical errors in general became kind of a big deal around 1999 after the release of an Institute of Medicine report titled To Air is Human, Building a Safer Health System. And now this report highlighted medical errors in a way that hadn't really been done before. And as a result, the public responded by insisting on safer health care. Not only that, but the report also outlined how costly errors can be. So hospitals and other facilities really began to work to reduce errors. The laboratorians have a history of tracking and fixing errors and keeping error rates low, but they do still occur. So we'll talk about that today. So the objectives for today's lecture, number one, define laboratory error and describe the phases of the total testing process. Number two, explain what is meant by pre-analytical phase and list examples of pre-analytical errors. Number three, explain what is meant by post-analytical phase and list examples of post-analytical errors. Number four, explain what is meant by analytical phase and list examples of analytical errors. Number five, list steps to minimize errors in each testing phase. And number six, discuss ways to identify errors and the importance of error prevention. So what is a laboratory error exactly? The term laboratory error is defined as any defect that occurs during the entire testing process from ordering tests to reporting results that in any way influences the quality of laboratory services. So this phrase or term laboratory error um, has a very broad definition. And because it includes things that occur outside of the lab, it kind of begs the question, how much control do we actually have over these processes. So in laboratory medicine, the entire testing process from start to finish is sometimes referred to as the total testing process. And this begins and ends with the patient. So the patient comes in, they have certain symptoms, lab tests are ordered based on those symptoms. The testing process occurs, then results are reported, and the provider communicates those to the patient and determines a treatment plan based on the results. So we start and end with patient. Now the total testing process can be broken down into three phases. You've got the pre-analytical phase, analytical phase, and the post-analytical phase. Now the pre-analytical phase includes all the steps prior to testing. The analytical phase involves all the processes that are involved in testing. And the post-analytical phase includes everything after the test analysis. So laboratory errors can occur in any of these three phases. Pre-analytical errors are those that occur in the pre-testing phase. This includes everything from the initial test request patient and specimen identification, specimen collection, transport, and receiving of the specimen in the lab. Errors in this phase are often due to failure to adhere to policies and procedures, and this can occur both inside the lab and outside the lab. Also, these errors can be made by both laboratory, sorry, laboratory personnel and non-laboratory personnel. Pre-analytical errors are the major source of errors in the testing process. One study quotes that they account for up to 70% of lab mistakes, and another study claims they account for 46 to 68%. And these types of errors are difficult to determine because there are so many steps in the pre-analytical phase. It's difficult to pinpoint where the breakdown occurred. And that also makes them hard to monitor and resolve. 
One study I read stated that more than one in four pre-analytical errors are estimated to result in unnecessary investigation or inappropriate treatment for patients. And investigations can take time and be costly, and patients can potentially be harmed by inappropriate treatment. So think about that. One in four pre-analytical errors could result in that. Common pre-analytical errors include the wrong test being ordered, incorrect information on the test requisition, patient not identified correctly, specimens mislabeled or not labeled at all, compromised specimen integrity, so hemolysis, clots, that kind of thing, or patient is not given the proper pre-collection instructions, such as fasting for 12 hours. So these are some images of some pre-analytical errors. Um, and you see up in the left-hand corner, you've got the two tubes taped together. Um, if you notice on that label on the gold top, it's um, a test ordered is HbA1c. So it looks like they drew it in the wrong tube, realized it, and then sent it down with the correct tube um, and just thought we could just pour it over and everything is, is fine. Um, then you see these tubes that have been centrifuged upside down, so I've never seen that. That's interesting. Um, the tube there that appears to be melted was one that um, needed to be kept warm, and they did that by putting it in boiling water, so it is indeed melted. And then this last one, I just can't even wrap my head around how this would happen, um, but it says the label is inside the urine tube. So you can kind of see there's a label there um, inside the tube with the urine, um, and I just, I just can't with that. So I'm sure that you guys have all seen your fair share of crazy things like this. Now, how do we fix this? So there are several ways we can minimize pre-analytical errors. Phlebotomy education is super important, but it can be difficult depending on the size of your facility and who's responsible for drawing blood at your facility. So in a larger hospital like UAMS, we have phlebotomists, medical assistants, patient care techs, and nurses that draw blood. So this can make it really hard to educate everyone consistently or standardize that training. So in addition, appropriate use of technology like barcode scanners can help eliminate manual entry errors. Some places have the scanners where you scan the patient's armband um, and then their labels print out for their lab testing. So that kind of helps eliminate um, some of that mislabeling. Now, appropriate supplies for venipuncture is also important. So remember we discussed in the specimen collection lecture that inappropriate supplies can lead to hemolysis, clotting, um, short draws, and that kind of thing. So everyone involved in pre-analytical processes should adhere to all guidelines, policies, and procedures. And these procedures need to be written in a way that is clear to everyone from phlebotomists with a high school education to RNs, um, advanced practice nurses, PAs, doctors, and so on. So everyone, no matter their education level, needs to be able to understand these policies and procedures. And finally, quality indicators should be identified and monitored. So for instance, your facility may choose to monitor recollected specimens to pinpoint the problem, and then attempt to fix it. Um, sometimes these kinds of things are all required by your accrediting agency also. So a little side note here. Um, some people refer to the initial part of the pre-analytical phase um, as the pre-analytical -pre phase. I know, it's kind of silly. But in general, this term refers to everything before the specimen collection. So test selection and ordering, identification of tests needed, entering test requisitions, and so on. And on the subject of test utilization, um, I just wanted to point out that ASCP has actually been involved in an initiative to really improve um, test utilization. So this initiative is called Choosing Wisely, and they are really working to educate providers about lab tests um, and how to choose the best one for the situation that they're in.
And analytical errors are those that occur during the testing phase. Um, these errors occur in the lab. So examples of these kinds of errors include specimen testing, equipment issues, reagent issues, work environment, and inadequate staffing, among others. Um, and these errors can be the result of failure to follow policy, but they are not always um, because you're not following policy. And it's not always a lack of knowledge that occurs that um, causes this type of error either. So sometimes you know you have the knowledge and things just happen. So an abnormal result uh, might have been accidentally verified and reported out. Um, it's not that you didn't know that it was an abnormal result needed to be addressed. Um, it's just that it kind of slipped through. Analytical errors account for about 7 to 15 percent of total testing process errors, um, according to these two studies. So these types of errors have the lowest rate of all three phases. So that is good for laboratorians um, because we, that means that we are doing a good job at kind of keeping our error rates lower. And these errors can be caused by both humans and instrumentation. So we all know that our analyzers act up occasionally, and when that happens, there is potential for errors to occur. So I'm sure that you all have had a day that you feel like this guy, um, and this is just how you have to fix the chemistry analyzer or the hematology analyzer. Um, you're going to fix it, and it's all going to be good, right? Now, common analytical phase errors that we see are quality control or calibration errors, uh, manual pipetting errors, reagent issues, specimen interference, so maybe hemolysis or lipemia, um, dilution and or calculation errors, and inadequate staffing. So how do we minimize the errors made during the analytical phase? So the implementation of automated systems can standardize how specimens are processed um, and therefore it lessens the potential for human error. So bringing in automation um, a lot of times can help us eliminate some of those errors. The procedures and policies should be in place, of course, and they also should be clearly written so that there is little chance of confusion or misinterpretation. And there should also be rigorous training programs in place as well as a QA program that assesses and evaluates your procedures. And finally, um, adequate staffing in the lab can help eliminate things um, like staff multitasking, increased distractions like staff running the analyzer but also answering the phone, um, and you get kind of burned out, lots kind of experience fatigue sometimes from being overworked because you're understaffed. Now, I realize that this is easier said than done, but in a perfect world, we would all have a fully staffed lab all the time, um, which would really help us reduce those error rates. So on to post-analytical errors. So these occur in the post-testing phase. And they can include uh, things like clerical errors, reporting test results, interpretation of results, follow-up, specimen storage, and retesting. And post-analytical errors um, can result from failure to adhere to policies and procedures, um, but they also they occur both inside and outside the lab. And they can be made by laboratory personnel as well as non-laboratory personnel. So very similar to pre-analytical errors in that sense. And post-analytical errors also include the process of the provider receiving the results, interpreting those results, and then developing a plan based on those results. So some of this is kind of out of the lab's control, but is still considered a laboratory error. Now post-analytical errors are the second most common errors in the three phases. Uh, one study stated that up to 23% of all lab mistakes were post-analytical, and another study claimed that 18 to 47% were post-analytical. These types of errors um, 
much like the pre-analytical errors, can be difficult to identify and monitor. And while there are fewer steps in the post-analytical phase, these often occur outside of the lab, making it hard to track them. Uh, this phase is also kind of the final quality check for pre-analytical and analytical testing. So sort of your last chance to catch any errors that may have occurred, occurred in those phases. So common errors in the post-analytical phase include critical results not being reported or being delayed, results not being reviewed or verified before uh, being reported out, clerical errors that might lead to erroneous results, uh, maybe you're manually entering results and you make an, an error, make a mistake, um, abnormal results not being recognized by the provider, so maybe it's a test they're not super familiar with um, and they don't realize that those results are not normal, um, and failure of the provider to order appropriate follow-up testing um, can be one of the errors that we see, um, or we see providers that fail to communicate the results to the patient. So again, some of these are occurring outside the lab and they really depend on the provider to do the right thing. So we may not have a lot of control over these types of errors. How do we minimize the post-analytical errors? Um, using appropriate technology, um, so you can use barcode readers to properly track and store specimens so you don't have those issues of um, inappropriate storage for certain specimens. You can implement automatic verification of normal results. Um, again, develop clearly written procedures for reporting results. And this can also help with consistency across the lab for results reporting. Um, the more consistent your results reports are, um, the better it is for your providers. And then you can educate the providers on resources that are available for result interpretation. So not only are we available in the lab, they can call and talk to us about some of this stuff, um, but there should also be a pathologist available. So if a provider is having difficulty understanding the results, they should be able to consult with um, that pathologist. So just like we have the pre-pre-analytical phase, there's also um, a post-post analytical phase, and that's sometimes referenced. And the term generally refers to the final steps in the post-analytical process. So it's really talking about um, provider receiving results, interpreting those results, and communicating those to the patient. So I just really want you guys to be aware of these two terms just in case you come across them at some point. Um, I just want you to know kind of what that refers to. Now let's talk for a minute about how we can identify these errors. It's important to identify them as well as monitor them because that's an opportunity for us in the lab to really improve the quality of um, lab services. So identifying them can come from incident reports that are sent in, um, sometimes patient complaints or complaints for, from providers or other healthcare personnel can clue us into um, errors that are being made. Or we can look at laboratory results, uh, laboratory reports, such as your turnaround times, um, recollects, repeated tests, and that kind of thing. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with those types of reports. And then once we've identified the errors, it really becomes easier to address them. So I also think that you guys need to be aware of um, what is called reportable errors. So there are three types of reportable errors. You've got adverse events, near misses, and sentinel events. Adverse events are those in which the patient is harmed or injured due to either lack of treatment or negative treatment outcomes. And a near miss is a situation where the patient was not affected, they were not harmed or injured, but they could have been if the almost error had not been caught. And then a sentinel event um, is one in which a patient dies unexpectedly or they are seriously injured. And now this type of event is going to trigger immediate action in your facility and there will be an investigation and some type of response. 
Um, these types of events must be documented and reported. And often you're required to report these to the Joint Commission or whatever um, agency accredits your facility. Reporting errors at your facility, of course, you should always do that according to um, your policy. Uh, I want to talk about near-miss events for a second. So near-miss events, um, when you, those are reported, um, how they are reported is going to vary between facilities, but they can often be reported using an online system. So um, Arkansas Children's Hospital has a system called SafetyNet, and UAMS has a system called Safety Intelligence, um, where employees have access. If they have some type of event, they can go into that system and report it. So reporting near misses um, should not be punished. So if there are punitive consequences to reporting these um, near misses, then they are much less likely to get reported. So if you, if you see something or you're involved in a near miss and you know you're going to get in trouble if you report it, how likely are you to report it, right? So they actually now are starting to um, sort of recognize people that do catch these things. So here at UAMS, um, they have what's called the good catch um, and it's where they basically recognize those individuals for um, the near misses and catching it before it harms some type of patient. So why is all of this so important anyways? First and foremost, reducing laboratory errors is what is best for our patients. So remember that approximately 70% of clinical decisions are based on lab results. So think about how many patients could be affected if laboratory errors were common. It could affect a lot of patients, right? So errors, both laboratory and medical, um, they also lead to increased healthcare costs um, as well as de decreased patient satisfaction. So in addition to all of that, you're also going to see increased operating costs, not only for the lab, but for the facility in general. Um, rising operating costs, usually that is going to ultimately come back and, and affect your pocketbook, right? So if we reduce errors um, and we see that we are not increasing the cost of operation because of those errors, because we've reduced them, right? Um, there's not as much money going into the operations. That frees up a little bit more money that hopefully we come back to you at some point. Also, these errors can weaken confidence in the healthcare system in general. So if you have certain populations that are hesitant to seek medical treatment anyways, and they finally go to the doctor only to experience a medical or laboratory error, they are likely not going to seek treatment again for a very long time. So ultimately, this can affect health disparities that already exist in a negative way. So it can kind of make those health disparities um, worse. So to wrap things up, always make sure you've got the right person, the right sample, the right test, the right result at the right time and the right place so that we can get the right patient outcome. So that's it for this lecture. Um, if you need to talk or chat about anything, um, my information is there. Please get in contact with me and let me know. Um, and of course, here are the references for this lecture.